Th thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Frank, for that uh, very kind introduction. Sarah, thank you so much for inviting me and for honoring me along with the, uh, the other very uh, distinguished uh, winners of, of your uh, award tonight. And uh, it's just an honor to be here with all of the supporters of Emmett. This is a fantastic uh, organization. It really does extraordinarily important work on a continuing basis. It's a, it's a real tribute to Sarah and everybody who's worked with her. I mean, they have built it literally from scratch and uh, uh, has a significant impact here in Washington on Capitol Hill, uh, hopefully a significant impact in the next administration uh, as well. Uh, but... <laughs> But all, all of you who are supporters of Emmett, your support is uh, much appreciated. Uh, it's put to very good use uh, and uh, encourage you even in a time when there are a lot of demands, especially as we come close to November, uh, to remember Sarah and Emmett and, and to keep that support coming in because the uh, work that's being done is, uh, uh, is ever more uh, critical. And I want to apologize to everybody for disrupting this carefully laid out program. Usually I try and disrupt our adversaries, <laughs> not, not our friends. And so my, my apologies to everybody. Uh, all I can say is that uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you my destination because it won't get me any sympathy, but I am going uh, to give a speech, the principal thrust of which is why we need to overthrow the current regime in Tehran as soon as possible. <laughs> Uh, and I, I do think this is, uh, this is really the, the center of the threats that we see emanating uh, in the Middle East today. There, there are a variety of developments on a whole range of fronts uh, that are very, very troubling and dangerous for the United States, for Israel, for our uh, other friends in the region, for uh, our friends around the world. And, you know, uh, I'm not going to be partisan here, of course. I'm just going to be analytical. Um, we have an administration that just does not pay adequate attention to the threats that the United States and its friends around the world face. That's just the reality. Um, and it's not like our adversaries aren't paying attention. Uh, they have taken the measure of this administration. They see that uh, on a good day, it's merely inattentive to uh, threats to the United States around the world. Uh, and on a particularly bad day, uh, it shows a weakness uh, and a, a level of comfort with America in decline that can only uh, give uh, encouragement to our adversaries. And we see it playing out uh, day by day in uh, the newspapers. And I don't mean the leaks out of the administration. That's bad enough in and of itself. I mean the developments around the world. Let, let's just look at uh, uh, at Iran. Uh, they have engaged us yet again. I've lost count of how many times either the Europeans or uh, the Security Council or others over the past 10 years have attempted to negotiate with Iran about its nuclear weapons program. Uh, there, there isn't any doubt that we are never going to chit chat Iran out of its nuclear weapons program. Uh, the whole idea that we're going to negotiate some kind of satisfactory resolution has been a snare and a delusion from the outset. When this was first uh, proposed by uh, British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw to Secretary of State Colin Powell in late 2002, it was a mistake then. It's been a mistake every day since then. It's a mistake today. Just, just consider... Just consider what we're talking about here. It has been at least the declared position of the United States uh, that we don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons. Uh, it is clearly the position of Iran, uh, based on their actions uh, these last 20 years, that they want nuclear weapons. Okay, great, so let's sit down. What are we going to negotiate about? What is the compromise position? Is it that Iran gets to keep a small number of nuclear weapons? Is that the compromise that negotiation will bring us to? Look, negotiation is like all other 
human activity. It has costs as well as benefits. When people say, well, what can it hurt to negotiate, uh, it reflects a naivete about international diplomacy. If negotiation really were cost-free, then it probably wouldn't hurt anything. But negotiation in circumstances where we're dealing with a nuclear proliferator is very costly indeed, because what Iran has done for 10 years is string out negotiations, providing them with a patina of legitimacy while they have spent 10 years advancing their nuclear weapons uh, aspirations. And every day that goes by under the guise of having further negotiations just brings them closer to that long sought objective. You know, when you go to bed tonight, you won't hear it, but in and around Iran, others will hear the hum of those centrifuges spinning, enriching uranium. And when you wake up in the morning, those centrifuges will still be spinning. And when you go to bed tomorrow night, they'll still be spinning. And every hour they spin enriches more uranium. What's really remarkable about uh, the uh, Iranian nuclear weapons program, which I've watched very, very carefully, is what a slow and measured pace they have had, especially these last 10 years. You'd think they'd be rushing to get that first nuclear weapon, but they're not. They're building a broad and deep nuclear infrastructure. Uh, they made a very significant step last year when they inserted fuel into the Bushir reactor. Uh, people say, well, it's just a civil power reactor. It's proliferation resistant, as some people say. When I was in the uh, government, I asked our Department of Energy what it would mean if Bushir ever came online. And the Department of Energy said that after normal operation as a commercial reactor, the same way we'd re operate a reactor of the same size in this country, that after three to five years of normal operation with one fuel load in the reactor, only one fuel load in the cooling ponds after having been taken out of the reactor, and only one fuel load waiting to go in, which is standard industry practice. If you ran all of that uh, fuel through the reactor, you would have enough plutonium in the spent fuel, which when we processed would give Iran 60 nuclear weapons. So they've already passed one line. They won't have the plutonium for some period of time, but they don't appear to be in a rush. Uh, if they did have to rush, uh, I think they could have a nuclear weapon within four months. Uh, the fact is, and that's based on what we know. That's based on what we know. Uh, what worries me more than anything is how much we don't know about what's inside Iran. So when you see negotiations like the ones we have now and see the time that Iran has bought over this last 10 years, you can see why negotiations are not cost free. In an effort to stop a nuclear proliferator, time is on the side of the proliferator. Time is a critical asset. Time is what they need to overcome the scientific and technological difficulties uh, toward getting nuclear weapons. And I'm not even talking here about their ballistic missile program, which would give them a global strike capability. If they can build a nuclear device, they can put it in a tramp steamer, they can sail it into any harbor in the world, uh, and they can detonate it in that harbor with, uh, with terribly devastating effects. All of this is going on uh, while we're still negotiating. Now, people say that sanctions uh, are going to have an effect on Iran. I think they may have an economic effect. They may have already. But let's take a look at North Korea, the most heavily sanctioned country in the world, where the people live in poverty. They've already exploded two nuclear devices and are apparently preparing for a third. A determined regime uh, is not going to be stopped by sanctions, especially in this context when Russia, China, Venezuela, and any number of other countries are fully prepared to help Venezuela evade the sanctions. We are coming very close to a crisis uh, on this. I, I fear that there are many people in the United States, especially in the administration, who will say, well, we don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons. That wouldn't be a good thing. But we can live with a nuclear Iran. We can contain and deter a nuclear Iran the same way we contained and deterred the Soviet Union during the Cold War. I think that's delusional. Number one, who wants to live under the system of deterrence that we had during the Cold War, where we came perilously close 
uh, to nuclear war on too many occasions. Who wants to replicate that, number one? But number two, the mindset of the rulers in Tehran is very different from the mindset of the rulers in Moscow during the Cold War. I don't think they're subject to the same calculus of deterrence uh, that the Soviets were. Look, if you prize life in the hereafter more than life on Earth, you're not subject to deterrence. Uh, and that's, their, that's the view of this theocratic regime. Uh, you know, the, the United States is a very diverse country, but I like to say that our uh, view on that subject is summed up in the Kenny Chesney song, country and western song, which, trust me, I won't sing, but, <laughs> but, but Kenny Chesney's line is, everybody want to go to heaven, nobody want to go now. <laughs> That's why we're deterrable, and it's why the Iranian leadership today is not. But even if I were completely wrong, even if you could contain and deter a nuclear Iran, it doesn't stop with Iran. Even Secretary of State Clinton has said that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia will get nuclear weapons, Turkey will, Egypt will, perhaps others will, so that in a very short period of time as these things go, five to ten years, you could have half a dozen nuclear weapon states in the Middle East. This is an inherently dangerous and unstable situation in what is already an inherently dangerous and unstable region. So time is very short. Our policies are not going to succeed at their stated objective of preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. The consequences for the United States and uh, Israel if this happens are grave indeed. Our options are very, very limited and entirely uh, unattractive if military force has to be used. But as unattractive as the military option is, how much more dangerous and risky is it to see Iran with nuclear weapons. Anything you don't like about Iran today, like for instance the fact that it's the world's central banker for international terrorism, all of that gets far worse once they have nuclear weapons. So when you look at that, when you look at the uh, uh, parlous developments in Egypt, in Libya, in Syria, when you look at the growing threats to uh, Israel as a consequence of the deteriorating security situation in the region as a whole, when you look at the policies of the government of Russia that seem determined to put a thumb in their eye any place they can, uh, whether it's for old times' sake or what, I don't know, but the Russians are uh, more and more uh, belligerent in their approach to uh, policy generally. We see China being uh, uncooperative on a range of fronts. We see threats in our own hemisphere. This is a time as we approach this election season when uh, Citizens who are concerned about American national security, who are concerned about the security of our friends and allies uh, in the Middle East and around the world, this is the time when politicians have to listen to us. Now, I understand why the economy is the central issue in this upcoming election, but you can't have a strong American economy without a strong American presence in the world. We. We, we in the United States and our friends and allies provide whatever stability and security that there is in the world, and there is precious little. But if we are not up to that task, nobody else is going to do it for us. A lot of other people benefit from what we do, but we don't do it because of altruism. We do it because of us. And if we're not prepared to insist that our leadership back a strong America that protects our interests and our friends around the world, we will face the consequences, and even worse, our children and grandchildren will face the consequences. So that's why I come back to the work of Emmett. This is an organization that is determined to make Washington listen to the truth and to face up to reality. It's done extraordinarily important work. It has a lot more important work to do. I know that it will do it with your support, and I thank you once again for this uh, a very gracious honor that you've bestowed on me. Thank you very much.